statements, a list of the company's directors. Another one is notice of address of the registered office in Kenya. Notice of address of the registered office in Kenya. So notice of address, notice of address, notice of address of the registered office in Kenya. Notice of address of the registered office in Kenya. Notice of address of the registered office in, in Kenya. Notice of address of the registered office in Kenya. Notice, notice of address of the registered office in, in Kenya. Another one is notice of address, notice of address of the registered office in the country of origin. Notice of address of the registered office in the country of, of origin. Notice of address, notice of address of the registered office in the country of origin. Notice of address of the registered office in the country of origin. Notice of address of the registered office in the country of origin. So in the country of origin, where is the registered office? Is it in London? Is it, it's, it's actually basically located where? So original, original way to registered. What is the notice of address of the registered office from the origin uh, country, from the origin country? So those are basically some of the documents that will be required with regard to registration of a foreign uh, company, of a foreign company. So there's that uh, part two. So there's that part two. Roman 2, it says, with reference to foreign companies, explain three changes that require a 30-day notice before effecting. So what are the changes that will basically require a 30-day notice before they're actually effected in a foreign company? A 30-day notice before they're actually effected in the uh, company. So you can basically write changes in, so you can just say changes in so the there will be changes in, then you put a semicolon, then you can list them. So changes in. the local representative of the company, the local representative of the company, the local representative of the company, the local representative of the company. Uh, number two, number two. So remember what you said about a local representative. It is simply a person who is actually able to represent the company locally. So they could look for someone basically who basically understands the rules and regulations governing operations of companies to be able to guide the company on how it is supposed to conform as a foreign company with regard to operations in, in Kenya. So they look for a local representative. So sometimes they could actually basically change this particular local representative by basically appointing another, another person. Uh, So change in location, you can say change in location, change in location, change in location of its registered office, of its registered office, of its registered office, change in location of its registered office, registered office in the origin country, in the origin, in the origin country in the origin country so changes of location of its registered office in the origin country in the origin country change in the directors change in the directors 
change in the directors, change in the directors, directors of the company, change in the directors of the company, change in the directors of the company, change in the directors of the company, and their powers, and their powers, change in their powers also, and their powers, and their powers, and their powers. So here you can say the change in the local representative of the company, change in the local representative of the company, and also and his address, and his address, his address. So changing maybe the address of the local representative. So also maybe changing his address then location of its registered office in the country of origin, then changing the directors of the company and their powers. Are there any changes in the powers of the directors of the company? Another thing is that change in the articles, change in the articles, change in the articles of association, in the articles of association or memorandum of association change in the articles of association or memorandum of association. Change in the articles of association or memorandum of association. Change in the articles of association or memorandum of association. Then part B, then we have part B there. So part B, it says in the context in the context of formation of companies in your country, outline five particulars that might be stated in the application for registration of a company. So in, down, in this case, they are not talking about a foreign company. They're just talking about a resident company that basically you want to register. So what will basically be uh, some of the documents, basically what will be some of the particulars that are supposed to be stated in the application for registration of that particular uh, company, of that particular company. So uh, you can be able to mention the notice, or basically you can be able to say the notice of location of the registered office. So notice of location of the registered office should actually clearly come out. So notice of location of the registered office or your registered office. So notice of location, notice, notice of location of the registered office so you should actually basically clearly state where is the registered office of the company notice of location of the registered office of the registered office so another thing that is actually very important is um the nominal capital the nominal capital the nominal capital of the company, of the company, or basically you can say the registered capital of the company. With which capital are you basically registering your company? Your company? So you can say the nominal capital, or you can say uh, the registered capital of the company. So you should actually clearly state what is the registered capital of the company uh, that you are going basically to register your company uh, with. So another thing that will basically be there is um, the address, or basically the address, the address, the address, you can say the names, the names, and address, address of the directors of the company, of the directors, directors of the company the names and address of the directors of the company, directors of the company. So you fill out certain forms that basically will clearly indicate what is the name of the director of the company and what is the address of um, that particular company. Uh, other particulars that will basically be included are the copies, copies of ID, copies of ID. We have copies of ID. Uh, and say carry pins and passport size photos, passport 
size photos, passport size photos of the directors of the company, of the directors, directors of the company, of the directors of the company, of the directors of, of the company. So you can also be able to uh, uh, talk about um, the articles, the articles of association, the articles of association and the memorandum of association. Or can simply be able to just say the constitution of the company, the constitution of the company or the rules governing the internal affairs of the company. So they should actually basically be stated or be attached or included in that particular request for registration of, of the company. So these are some of the particulars that should actually be able to come out clearly when you are seeking to register your, your company, when you are seeking to register your, uh, your company. Then uh, another thing that is, the, the, other, the other question is basically asking, you describe the prescribed uh, format of an articles of association. So the prescribed format of an articles of association. So hope you can be able to see it. So Roman two, describe the prescribed format of an articles of association. Those are clearly indicated. These are basically rules governing the internal affairs of the company. And we said when you are registering your company, you have two options, either to use the model articles that are already in existence under the Companies Act, or basically you can prepare your own articles of association. So if you prepare your own articles of association, basically, uh, uh, this particular articles of assume that you're actually preparing, that you're actually preparing, it is a requirement that it actually meets, or uh, basically it is actually in a prescribed uh, format. So uh, what is the format? What is the format? So it is actually in your notes. So someone who has read the formation of companies, basically you come across uh, this particular format we are talking about. This particular format they are talking about. So, uh, so the first one uh, should be in an English language. Should be in an English language. Should be in an English language. The article should actually be in an English language. The other thing, uh, the article should actually be paragraphed. So it should be divided into paragraphs. Uh, divided the article should be should be divided into paragraphs should be divided into paragraphs divided into paragraphs paragraphs which are numbered consecutively which are numbered consecutively which are numbered consecutively articles which are actually numbered consecutively then uh, other another thing is that um uh the articles should actually be dated so they should be dated so the articles should be they should be dated they should be be dated they should be dated then the other thing is that uh, signed by signed by the article should be signed by subscribers signed by subscribers subscribers to the memorandum of association, or basically those who have agreed to be the first members of the company, they should actually be able to at least sign those particular articles to clearly indicate, basically those will be the rules governing the internal affairs of, of the company. Then, uh, so signed by subscribers to the memorandum in the presence of, in the presence, in the presence of a witness 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 then uh, another thing is that uh, the articles uh, they should be printed they should be printed they should be printed for presentation to the register of companies when the company is actually going to be to be formed when the company is actually going to be formed so this is basically the formats under which you basically prepare your own articles to be able to present to the register of companies to seek for registration of the company, to seek for registration 
for the company. So this particular question was actually from uh, formation of companies. So formation of companies is actually a very key topic. It's actually a very key topic. So hope you've been able to capture all of them. So the format or prescribed format of an articles of association of an articles of association. So, uh, so there's this particular topic we covered, so formation of companies. Excuse me, Malim. Yes. Now, in this question, yes, uh, we were the examiner asked the to be like the question read describe the prescribed format, and here I can see that we've just listed, we've not described. Mm. What was what was the number of marks five? Uh, yeah, five. Uh, for me, I, I think I think the best way is to be able to list your points, because if you write in a paragraph, high chances you won't actually be able to score your uh, your five marks. No, because... what what I'm like what I'm trying to say, to, I what I think, uh. I don't know whether I'm right. Like if you have been told to describe, like for example be in English language, then there is some sh short narration about being in English language, then mm. be dated, a small narration, should be printed, a small narration, be divided into paragraphs, something of that sort. Okay, I think I think if they, they could have asked for explain, then basically you could actually list the points and you actually explain. But uh, what are you to explain when you tell someone uh, the article should actually be in an English language? What are you supposed to explain there further? Someone should actually be able to get that is basically meaning these particular articles should actually be in a language known as English. What furthermore can you actually explain with such kind of a point? So uh, basically, uh, according to me, maybe you are thinking that maybe this particular uh, answer should actually be in a paragraph form. But for me, I would actually advocate for a paragraph form because the easiest way for someone to be able to capture your points, if you basically you just list them, if you're able to list them, it will be very fast for this particular person who's marking the paper to be able to capture the points. Remember, this person is marking the papers, probably is marking a lot of uh, answer sheets. So if you put there like a paragraph, so most probably the points would actually be uh, captured very fast. Maybe you could actually assume you've just made one one point. But if your points can actually be listed, if you look at the number of marks, it's like five. If you just list those particular five points, so you can actually be able to easily score the marks because you'll be able to see clearly you've said the first point is actually in an English language. But to me, uh, explaining to someone the article should actually be in an English language, what furthermore can you actually explain? There's nothing basically to be, to be able to explain there, unless maybe it is uh, something that is basically a bit complicated. So you need to basically make a further narration, or maybe it is actually a case question. So you need actually to be able to elaborate your points. But for this particular one, I think the points are actually quite direct. You can actually be able to say maybe the article should actually be in an English language. To me, I don't think basically that particular point you should actually explain further. There's nothing you can actually explain further there because what you simply mean, these articles should actually be in a language known as English. So there's nothing to be able to explain further there to me, unless maybe, uh, I don't think there's anything to be able to explain there. So I hope, I hope you've been able to get what I mean. Yeah. Okay, fine. So, uh, so that particular question was actually from uh, formation of companies. Remember, the easiest way you, you the easier you make the examiner to be able to see your points, the easier you're actually likely to pass the exam very, very easily. But if you make the life of the person marking the paper to be very difficult, and then uh, clearly if he has marked, let's say, for example, in a day like 300 scripts, then yours is actually the number 301. So this person basically is probably tired. 
So if you don't actually clearly make your points to be seen very clearly, then most probably basically could actually basically end up not giving some of the, uh, the marks. So, uh, and sometimes uh, the, the number of marks on a question should actually basically be able to guide you as to how you are supposed to approach the question. Let's say, for example, uh, they have told you explain maybe uh, that particular question is actually asking you to explain four points. So you explain like four points. And then they are probably put there eight marks. So to this one, basically, uh, it simply means that, for example, if you state the points, if you have something to explain, you can actually explain further so that you can actually be able to score two marks a point. But if they have said basically state like four, state four, uh, let's say, for example, four points, then they have just put here four marks. So most probably they just want you to clearly set the points as you go, set the points as you go, because for each and every point, you'll be able to score a mark. But if they have said explain, most probably they want you to set the points. Then according to the number of marks here, each and every point has like two marks. So when you set your points, then you can actually elaborate further. If basically you have something to be able to, uh, to explain. For uh, the case questions, the case questions, those ones you can actually be able to use paragraphs. You can use paragraphs to be able to explain. So once you start writing the answer to that particular case question, you can put the first paragraph that actually ends at a particular point. Once you've made the point, you can go to the other paragraph like that. Then you also make your point. Then you can actually basically also end up with another paragraph. According to the mark, let's say, for example, they say like eight marks. Most probably if you come up with, let's say, for example, four paragraphs, then most probably you'll actually be able to score your eight, eight marks. So for case questions, most probably you won't actually list the points like this. You just write paragraphs. You write a paragraph that clearly basically indicates, or maybe you look at one of the questions there so that you can actually be able to understand what I mean by being able to use paragraph. It is a, if it is actually a question that is actually a case question or it's a scenario. So they have told you basically to explain, for example, the applicable legal principles. For example, in that case, the first thing that you should actually be able to clearly state there, you can be able to say, state maybe the applicable legal principles in this case relate to maybe rules governing uh, pre-incorporation contracts. So if you basically state that particular point, this particular examiner should actually be able to know that you basically understand what is being tested in this particular question without having to look further for that particular clear point whereby you're actually able to grasp very fast what is being tested here is basically rules governing um, pre-incorporation contracts if that one actually clearly comes out in your first paragraph then of course you go to the next paragraph now you tackle the facts in the question so you now try to relate those particular rules governing uh, pre-incorporation contracts with the scenario you've actually basically been given in the next paragraphs so probably you, you basically score easily your your marks so just make sure that your point, the main points are actually shouting. For that one, basically, the first point there, the rules, uh, the applicable legal principles in this case relate to rules governing pre incorporation contracts. So, because that particular scenario they have explained, it is relating to that. So, that particular point is actually shouting. It is basically clearly indicating to the examiner, you basically understand what has actually been examined. And most probably, if you basically set such kind of a point, sometimes even now, if this person is actually tired, you won't actually even basically look at most of the other parts because your first point is actually very clear. Most likely, it's basically like maybe going to assume you've actually basically answered the other parts very well. So you can imagine if someone has been, just as I've told you, he's marking 300, he has marked 300 scripts in a day. So you are exactly the number 301. So you can imagine if that point of yours, rules governing, uh, uh, is, not, is not actually coming out clearly, he'll basically struggle to look for it. If he doesn't actually basically get it in the paragraph, which you basically stated maybe down there, he'll basically assume maybe you don't understand what has actually been examined. So using basically dashes to clearly indicate your points, is actually uh, one of the ways to be able to make the examiner to be able to see your main points very easily.
so that you can actually be able to identify them and actually give you a, a score. So uh, I hope I've made my point clear. And of course, also the marks can actually be able to guide you as to how you can actually be able to elaborate your, your points. If basically they have said explain four and they have put like eight marks, most probably you should actually be able to elaborate the point a bit further to be able to score two marks a point. Basically, they have just indicated state four. Why do you go ahead and actually explain? Don't they actually explain. Just state the four by using the dashes or maybe using number one, number two, so that this person can clearly get your points very clearly and give you a, a score. So I hope I've made my point uh, very clear. Make the examiner to be able to see your main points. Don't make the examiner to struggle to get your main points. Just hit on the main points. Hit on the main points, even if it is actually very brief, you'll actually be able to score your, your marks. You could actually basically end up writing a very long paragraph, but there's no basically clear answer in your paragraph. But if basically you make like, let's say for example, a six word sentence and your point has come out very clearly, you'll be able to easily score your, your marks. Your points will actually basically be seen very easily by the examiner. He'll basically give you the, the marks. So just target on the main points, even if they're actually very brief. Basically, if you write them, you'll basically score your, your marks. You'll be able to score your marks. Don't make the examiner to struggle to get your, your points. So uh, I wanted to basically um, try to elaborate something here on formation of companies. So uh, in this particular topic, uh, when we were learning about it, so I, to I taught you about um, who is a promoter, who is a promoter, who is a promoter. We learned about uh, the duties of a promoter, duties of a promoter, duties of a promoter. We learned about, um, we learned about uh, remuneration of a promoter, remuneration of a promoter, of a promoter. We learned about uh, the rules governing pre-incorporation contracts, rules governing pre-incorporation contracts, pre-incorporation contracts, pre-incorporation contracts. We also learned about um, how the promoter can avoid liability, how the promoter can avoid liability on pre-incorporation contracts. Promoter can avoid liability on pre-incorporation contracts. Then uh, we learned about the procedure of incorporating a company, procedure of incorporating a company, incorporating a company. Then we learned about the articles of association and also we learned about the memorandum or association. So uh, I think who is actually a promoter, you can actually be able to know. So we say that uh, this is actually a person who undertakes to form a company and actually set it as a going concern. So going concern basically, it means it is actually be able to exist for the foreseeable future. So that is person is actually, is actually known as a promoter of the company. This promoter, he has actually key duties. So propose the name of the company, propose the registered office of the company, propose the first bankers of the company, first auditors, first directors, prepare the constitutive documents of the company, that is the memorandum and articles of the company, enter into contracts on behalf of the company before incorporation, which are known as pre-incorporation contracts, just to facilitate the formation of the company, then of course submit the required documents to the registrar for the formation of the company. Because they could ask you basically what are some of the duties of a promoter of a company. So if you know who is actually a promoter, then those actually points should actually be able to come out very clearly that he basically proposes the name, proposes the registered office, proposes the first directors, first auditors, first bankers, first company secretary. He's the one basically will actually be able to propose because the company is not actually in existence to be able to appoint this person. So he simply just proposes. 
He prepares the rules governing the internal affairs that need to be submitted to the registrar. He prepares the memorandum that basically will be submitted to the registrar when the company is actually to be, uh, to be formed. Those are some of the duties of a promoter of a company. Then um, we say there's something we normally mention here among the duties that uh, this particular promoter has what we call a fiduciary duty to always act in good faith and in the best interest of the company. That is actually a very key point here. This promoter of the company should actually be able to act in the best interest of the company or actually in good faith. So he has a fiduciary duty to act in good faith or in the best interest of the company while undertaking the process of actually forming the company. And the point that actually normally comes out there, we say that if this particular promoter is actually involved in a contract or basically sells an asset to the company at a profit, the profit should actually basically be revealed. He has a fiduciary duty to reveal the profits to the company. That point is actually very, very important. This promoter of the company should actually act in good faith and in the best interest of the company such that if he sells an asset to the company at a profit, this profit should actually be revealed to the company after formation. Failure to reveal the profit, it is taken as being a secret profit. And of course, the company has a right to recover the secret profits if the promoter fails to reveal the profits. So that is basically a point that should actually be able to come out very clearly because in the exam they could ask what can the company be able to do in case they discover there's actually a promoter of the company who sold an asset to the company and he didn't actually reveal the secret profits, didn't reveal the profits. So the profits will be taken as secret profits and the company has a right to recover the profits. So how can they actually be able to recover the profits? So we say that, for example, if the asset if the asset basically is still actually in existence of the premises of the company, they'll be able to recover what we call the purchase price. What do we mean by recovering the purchase price? For example, they could actually be able to maybe return the asset to this particular promoter and of course ask him to bring the money in terms of the purchase price, the money they paid him at the purchase price. So in this case, if the asset is still in existence within the company, they'll recover the purchase price. But something might have happened. These assets might actually have, might have already actually been sold by the company to another party. So it is not actually in the premises or existence of the company. What will happen? They'll recover just the secret profits because they can't recover the purchase price. They have already sold the asset to another person. So what they can actually be able to recover from the promoter are the secret profits. So if the rights over the asset have been acquired by a third party, Yo asset washa uza. I wanna kwa yo company. I always recover purchase price in this case. What they'll do, they'll ask the promoter to give them the secret profits you actually realized on that asset when it was actually sold to the company. Alternatively, they could actually basically be able to sue for any damages or losses incurred as a result of that particular asset having been sold to, to the company. So those are some of the alternatives that they can actually be able to undertake in case they discover that this particular promoter has sold an asset to the company and he has actually basically made a secret profit. So if that basically is actually tested, I don't think that is basically great or you've not actually ever come across it. That is a point that should actually be able to go home. He has a fiduciary duty always to act in good faith. If this promoter sells an asset to the company at a profit, these profits must be revealed to the company. Failure to reveal the profits, they'll be taken as being secret profits. And the company has a right to recover the secret profits. That is a point that, that should actually be able to uh, go home. Then we have the remuneration. So I think this one was tested, I think, in the last sitting. So we say that uh, uh, it is mon not mandatory, basically, to remunerate a promoter of the company. But of course, the company will basically be able to find ways of how they can remunerate the promoter. So maybe by allowing him to be among the first directors, they give him free shares in the company, they give him shares at a discounted price. If he basically sells a shares, if it is a public company, he does an IPO for the company, they can give him a commission on the shares sold. Alternatively, they could allow him to sell assets to the company, assets to the company at a profit. But what are, what are we saying? The profits must actually be revealed. 
failure to reveal will be taken as being secret profit. So that's basically some of the ways of how the company can remunerate a promoter. But there is not actually basically any requirement under the law that a promoter of the company must be compensated or remunerated. But of course, those are the ways in which a company can compensate or remunerate a person who has actually undertaken a work as a promoter of the company. Rules governing uh, pre-incorporation contracts. Rules governing pre-incorporation contracts. What is a pre-incorporation contract? Just from the word pre incorporation what is incorporation registration of the company so this contract simply means they actually happened before the company was actually incorporated a company will be seen to have been incorporated when it gets what we call a certificate of incorporation from the register of companies anything that actually basically happens before that particular time and the date indicated on that particular certificate it is actually pre so all those contracts that were actually entered into before the company was actually incorporated are basically termed as being pre-incorporation contracts. They are known as pre-incorporation contracts. So what are the rules? So they're actually just like four, which are actually very key, four points which are actually very key. That's all, number one, all pre-incorporation contracts are normally void against the company and the company will never be held liable. These are contracts, as well as the Ingiwa Kati on the behalf of the company before it were incorporated, you can't blame the company. The company cannot be held responsible because it was not actually basically in existence when they are being entered into. So all pre-incorporation contracts, the company will not actually be held liable. Or basically we say the contracts are actually void against the company and the company cannot actually be held liable. That is point number one. Point number two, if it happens that this contract that was entered into before the company was incorporated is renegotiated under different terms. This contract now becomes this contract now becomes valid because it is like forming a new contract. An example we can actually be able to give is, for example, if there was a contract agreed upon, maybe by the promoter and the third party, in terms of how the payments should actually be made to that particular third party. If the company, after incorporation, renegotiates the terms of payment, maybe from maybe a month into fortnightly it simply means that there is like a new contract that has been formed now between a third party and the company so if the contract is renegotiated this actually validates the contract and therefore the company can actually be held responsible that is number two what are we saying number one all pre-incorporation contracts are void against the company the company will never be held liable number two if it happens that this contract is renegotiated this basically makes the company become liable because it is like entering into a new contract now with a third third party. Number three, any person who actually purports to enter into a contract on behalf of the company before the company is actually incorporated will be held personally liable. So you can see now that particular point basically shifts the blame to the promoter of the company because it's the one who's most likely to enter into a contract before the company is actually incorporated. So in such a case, that particular promoter will be held personally liable or any other person who carries out himself as basically entering into a contract on behalf of the company, he'll be held personally responsible. So any person who purports or carries out himself to enter into a contract on behalf of a company before it is incorporated, that person will be held personally liable. Number four, the last one, the company cannot enforce a pre-incorporation contract. A company cannot actually basically enforce a pre-incorporation contract. Those four rules are actually very important. So basically what here they like doing is maybe bringing a scenario. You need to be able to discover very fast. They are testing on rules governing pre-incorporation contracts. So if they mention somewhere that someone entered into a, a contract before the company was incorporated, very quickly you should actually be able to discover that is basically pre-incorporation contracts. And they're basically touching on rules governing pre-incorporation contracts. Alternatively, they could just basically ask the question very directly. State the rules governing pre-incorporation contracts. Or they just bring a scenario. So the last time they tested this one, it was actually very direct. They tested, set the rules governing pre-incorporation contracts. The other time they tested, they basically brought a scenario. 
So you're supposed to discover they are testing on rules governing pre and cooperation contracts. So they could bring a scenario whereby there's actually a promoter of a company who entered into a contract before the company was incorporated. So they basically ask you, what are the legal principles applicable in this case? So you should actually basically clearly indicate the rules, basically the legal principles applicable relate to rules governing pre and cooperation contracts, whereby they simply state, then you mention one, two, three, four, then you relate to the scenario, who will be held liable. So at the end of the day, basically it will actually be the promoter of the company, because if you look at those particular points, the blame is actually not on the company, unless the company renegotiates the contract. So those are the rules governing pre incorporation contracts. Then uh, there's this one, how the promoter can actually avoid liability on pre incorporation contracts. You've seen that from this particular rules we've just gone through, he or she there is a pre incorporation contract in Angukia promoter. Unoni na Angukia promoter, kwa sababu wanasema, any person who purports to enter into a contract on behalf of the company before it is incorporated will be held personally liable. Who is likely to enter into a contract on behalf of the company? It is the promoter of the company because he might enter into contracts to facilitate the formation of the company. For example, he could end up acquiring furniture just for the office that is basically upcoming for the company after incorporation. So he has already looked for space for the office of the company, although they are still in the process of registering the company. He acquires furniture to be put in the office so that basically when they get the certificate of incorporation, they commence business immediately. Those contracts entered into acquiring furniture before they get that certificate are pre-incorporation contracts. And we've seen Iongori in Angukia Nani, promoter of the company, the promoter of the company. So they are basically here, he has to find ways of how he can avoid Iongori. And as avoid that Iongori, or basically avoid those particular liabilities that are likely to arise in case the blame is actually there that maybe that particular contract was not actually fulfilled. So what are the ways in which the promoter of the company can avoid liability on pre incorporation contracts? Number one, what he can be able to do, it is simply basically not to enter into any contract. So just basically incorporate the company first before entering into any contract. In such a case, the question of pre incorporation contracts won't arise. So he won't basically go ahead and actually basically acquire that furniture, acquire that office space. Wait until that certificate comes out. Then he basically acquires the furniture in the name of the company. He acquires the office space in the name of the company, such that in case there's actually any defaults, who will actually be blamed? It will be the company and not the promoter of the company. Number one, just incorporate the company first before entering into any contract. That is number one, how we can actually be able to avoid this particular uh, kind of uh, blame or liability. Number two, what you can actually be able to do, it is actually simply acquiring an off-shelf company. So it doesn't actually basically undertake that process that is actually very tedious to form a company. So he simply acquires an already existing company or an off-shelf company. Then basically he just changes, for example, the ownership immediately. And of course now start contracting with that particular company. So number two, what you can actually be able to do, buy an option company or a company that is actually already in existence and of course contract with the company. So that is number two, how you can avoid it. Number three, enter into these contracts, green corporation contracts with the assurance he will be the majority shareholder stock director of the company, such that in case this particular contract is to be ratified, after formation or approved after formation, it will be very easy because here in Yokusema is actually the majority shareholder. In such a case, if he holds, for example, let's say 90% of the shares, what can you do? He can actually basically approve everything in the company because the voting rights of the company are actually attached on the number of shares you actually hold in the company. You basically hold 90%. It simply means you control the affairs of the company. Number three, enter into contracts with the assurance he will be the majority shareholder stock director of the company. In such a case, approving the contract after formation, it will be very easy for this particular person we are calling the promoter. Number four, what he can actually be able to do is simply inform a third party that in case the company does not ratify or approve the contract after formation, 
he shouldn't actually be blamed for any loss or liability. What he does in this case, and I inform the third party, we are entering into this particular contract, but we do a kwamba kampuni kiruka after formation or after incorporation, we see why we blame. We do a to kwamba in a pre-incorporation contract. So we are saying number four, assure a third party or inform a third party that in case the company does not ratify or approve the pre-incorporation contract, he should not actually be held responsible for any liability that is likely to, to arise. That is number four. Number five, what you can actually be able to do is to enter into what we call provisional contracts, subject to approval by the company after formation. What is a provisional contract? It is not the real contract. It is actually basically just a contract waiting. Basically now the real or actually the approved contract. In this case, you can actually be able to talk about, for example, when you do an exam in a university, they give you provisional results. Those provisional results have missing marks. Uh, a certain lecture is not actually being found. Now you start following up. Now you get the final transcript when basically you graduate at the end of your fourth, fourth year. So it's just a provisional contract that is not actually the actual contract. It is subject to approval by the company after formation. So simply enter into provisional contracts which are subject to approval by the company after formation. So that is basically how you can actually be able to avoid liability. You can actually be able to avoid liability. So this actually area is actually very key. This area is actually very key what we've just gone through. So they really like that particular area. It is one of the commonest area they like testing. So just about the promoter supreme cooperation contract there, 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 there. They like that particular area here. So you need to actually be very keen. And those particular points we've just gone through, they're actually very easy to, uh, to grasp and actually remember. Very easy. So if they test from this particular area, you shouldn't actually be able to get any difficulty. It is actually very easy to, to remember. If they bring the rules, very easy to remember. Just remember those particular four key points. If they put their eight marks, you go home with the eight marks. If they put their 10 marks, go home with the 10, 10 marks. So the procedure, so there's actually the procedure of actually forming a company. There's a procedure of actually forming a company. So in this case, they talk about uh, this one you can go back to your notes, but I can actually be able to summarize very fast. Uh, you talk about name search and reservation. To do a name search and reservation online on a platform known as eCitizen. So once you've been able to reserve your name, they basically give you time to prepare the constitutive documents. That is the memorandum of association and articles of association. These are actually very key, key documents. They're actually very key key documents. After that, you will prepare what we call a statement of nominal capital. That will be revenue terms. So this one basically will clearly indicate the registered capital with which you are registering your, your company. So it will be revenue uh, stamp. So in this case, on the first time you register the company, they won't charge you any stamp duty. But basically, for, of course, if you want to increase the share capital, let's say, for example, from maybe 100,000 to go up. So basically, you'll be seeking that they call upon you to be able to pay a stamp duty to the government. So if you can remember very well, when you talk about the memorandum and articles, we say that these particular documents were basically re-evaluated by the Companies Act of 2015. Let's say, for example, in this case, as I've told you, the articles, it is not mandatory you prepare your own articles. You can be able to use the model articles under the Companies Act. Alternatively, you can prepare your own and it should actually basically be in the format you've just gone, gone through. For the memorandum, also this one was actually re-evaluated. So these one are simply just represented by what we call forms. So uh, uh, we have form CR2, CR3, and that is CR4. So CR2 is actually basically for a company that is actually limited by, by shares. CR3 you fill in case you are raising a company limited by guarantee. CR4 is actually for unlimited, uh, companies. Also, what will be required, you'll be able to be, you'll, you'll be called upon to fill out from CR8. In this particular form, basically, there'll be the requirements to fill out the details of the director of the company, residential address, their contacts, their email address, all those will basically come out in a form, of, form known as from CR8. Then, of course, you'll be able to attach the documentation of the directors, let's say, for example, their pins, 
their passport size photos, copies of the national IDs. So once you, you are able to attack those ones, then you submit all those documents you've just gone through to the registered companies. So you will actually be able to evaluate them. And of course, if they're actually okay, your company will be incorporated. Your company will actually be, be incorporated. So that is what we covered. So here under the memorandum, so I told you there is basically uh, something you need to be able to note about the name of the company or the name clause. So say this one basically talks more about the company to the outside world. So you get, let's say, for example, the name clause, objective clause, the registered uh, capital of the company clause or share capital clause, the share capital clause, the liability clause. So here you have the name clause, liability clause, you have the objective clause. Clauses are simply just paragraphs. So they talk more about the objective of the company. You have the share capital clause. These are some of the clauses. Uh, in this one, then the registered office clause. And have the registered office clause. Talks more about the registered office of the company. So the ones I told you to be very keen is the name. If you are perusing this particular topic, never fail to peruse this particular area, the name, share capital, although it was tested, I don't think, in the last sitting. Then also this particular area, never fail to peruse this particular area, liability clause. They are one of the commonest areas that have been tested. So the name, for example, the name, they could ask you uh, which kind of names will actually not be accepted or basically will be rejected by the registered companies, for example, if you submit if you want to register your company. Uh, they could actually be able to talk about under what circumstances can the company actually be able to change its, its name. So they could ask about what are the requirements with regard to the name of the company after you've incorporated your, your, comp uh, your company. That the name should actually be able to appear in all the formal documents of the company that you issue. For example, the invoices, for example, any letters. So that's why people put a letterhead on all letters originating from the company. It is basically a requirement that the name actually clearly comes out, the name of the company. The name should actually basically be displayed in a conspicuous place or basically a visible place within the business premises. That's why basically when you visit any premise of any company at the reception, most probably you'll see the name of the company. So you'll see it there. It has been displayed. Any documents like invoices, you'll see the name of the company. Delivery notes, you'll be able to see the name of uh, the company. So with regards to names that are likely to be uh, uh, rejected or not actually accepted by the registered of companies, you can actually be able to talk about if the name is actually too similar to that of an actually on an already existing company, they won't allow such kind of a name. If the name has any connection to the office of the president, or basically any connection to the government, they won't allow any such kind of, of name. You can also be able to talk about if the name, name actually contains a proper name of a person who is not actually a director in the company. In this case, we mean, for example, if I, job, I, job, I, Mr. Job, if basically I go ahead and actually register a company that basically is actually known as, let's say, for example, Monica Onyango, yet Monica is not actually a director in that company. I should actually be able to give a proper explanation as to why I've used a proper name of a person who is not a director in the company. So such kind of names won't actually not be allowed. If you use a name of a person or a proper name of a person who is not actually a director in the company, they won't actually allow for such kind of a name to be registered. Also, if the name is actually confusing, so if it's actually basically confusing the members of the public or those basically are actually basically associated with the company, the name won't actually also be be allowed. So in this case, we talk about, for example, let's talk about uh, X, Y, Z auto spares. So yet the objective is not actually rhyming with that particular name. So auto spares most probably are dealing in spare parts. But basically the objective in this case, you are dealing with, let's say, for example, uh, cooking, uh, let's say, for example, cookies or maybe cakes. So auto spares and cakes, where does it, does it come? Does it rhyme? Not really. So maybe you could actually be able to talk about ABC bakery. But if you do ABC auto spares, yet your main objective is basically maybe to do uh, baking of, of cakes. 
it simply means that that particular name is actually confusing. So the register won't actually allow for such kind of kind of a name. So they won't actually allow for such kind of kind of a name. Also, if the name is actually prohibited under the National Emblems and Flags Act, so certain names have been preserved, so they're like state names. If they are actually basically under the National Emblems and Flags Act prohibited, then such kind of a name won't actually also be, be allowed. Then also uh, they could talk, uh, they could test about um, circumstances under which the name of the company could actually be changed. So in this case, if the register of companies inadvertently made a mistake and registered a name of a company that is already in existence, you could actually basically call upon the company to change its, its name. When you're registering the company, he made a mistake. He ended up registering the company, yet that name is actually already in existence. If, let's say, for example, if today you go and actually basically seek to register Safaricom. So inadvertently, he makes a mistake and registers your company as Safaricom. He discovers later that there's actually a company known as Safaricom. He could actually basically call upon you to basically change the name of your, your company. So that is a circumstance that can actually make a company to change its, its name. Another reason it could be, it can happen voluntarily. So the company could actually just wake up one day and they just voluntarily agree that they are going to change their, their name. Maybe they are rebranding. So they want basically now to maybe capture the market by rebranding afresh. So they can decide voluntarily, they just want to change their, their name. Alternatively, maybe someone could actually be able to go to the courts and maybe seek that the company changes its name because they are using maybe a name that is actually too similar to theirs. If the court basically declares in that case that the name is too similar, they could actually basically give out an order to the company to change its name. So we call it parsing of action, parsing of action. So parsing of action is simply where someone goes to the court, brings a complaint or sues the company that is using a name that is too similar to theirs. If they basically end up winning the case, the court can basically give out an order or declare the company changes its name. The company actually changes its name. So those are some of the circumstances that can actually be able to make uh, the company to change uh, its name. Uh, liability clause, they could actually basically talk about uh, how the liability of a member of a company can be increased. So you can be able to check your notes under liability clause. So share capital, I don't think they'll be able to test, but you can just go through it for your importance. So these are the common areas they like testing under the memorandum of association. So articles, I don't want to go there. I had already mentioned it, I think in our previous class, there's something I mentioned about rules governing alteration of articles of association. So we went through some of them and actually listed some of them in a particular question that we answered. So that's probably something you need to be able to maybe have a clue about what are the rules governing alteration of, of articles. Because if you are blank in that particular area, then they test that particular area because there's a time they tested that particular area with around 15 marks. So it's around 15 marks, uh, rules governing alteration of articles. And I think we went through the question. It was talking about Alex and other two shareholders. These particular shareholders want to evict Alex as the shareholder of the company. They want to change the articles of association by simply basically asking that any person carrying on a competing business should actually exit the company or should actually basically sell the shares to a nominee they have actually been able to choose. So you need to understand the rules governing the alteration of articles. So at least have a clue so that you are not actually blank if they're likely to test that particular area. So this topic is actually very important. And as I've clearly indicated to you several times, this particular topic is the most tested area in company law. So sometimes they could test up to 20 marks, up to 30 marks in a sitting. So it's not a topic to go to the exam if you don't have any clue about formation of companies. It is actually a very key topic. It is the most tested area in company law, according to the analysis, the questions that have really been tested, numerous among them in company law actually come from this particular topic known as formation of companies. So uh, I think that is basically what you need to, be able to know about this particular topic. As I've told you, this particular area is actually very important. So you don't need to go to the exam if you don't have a clue about a promoter remuneration, contracts, pay incorporation how to avoid liability, that, that, that particular area. 
So at least you should actually be able to have a, a clue if they talk about a promoter, secret profits. Something about secret profits, if a promoter makes secret profits, what can actually happen in such a case? So it's a very important uh, topic. So uh, I want us to move to another thing. So this one I won't repeat again, so I'm done with it. I won't repeat this particular area again. Maybe um, could you just highlight again. on... Yes, there's someone you... with a question. Yeah, I was hoping to uh, hear you highlight something in regards to the legal effects of articles of association and... Uh, for the legal effects, or oh, that yeah. area, so, that one has actually also really been tested. So the legal effects, uh, there's something we learned about. It binds the members to the company. It binds the company to the members. It binds the members among themselves. It binds the members in their capacity as members of the company. Or something I've forgotten. So it's good he has, he has reminded us. It has also really been tested. So the legal effects, what actually happens in case you register your articles? Once you deposit them, what are the effects? These articles, once you deposit them, they register of companies, they become rules governing the internal affairs of the company. Therefore, number one, what will happen? These particular articles will actually be able to bind the members to the company, members to the company, members to the company. Also, it will happen the other way around. Now the company will be bound to the members. It will bind the company to the members. Company to the members. Also, what will actually also happen, it will bind the members among themselves. Bind the members. Members among themselves. Among themselves. Themselves as members of the company. Also, what will happen, it will bind the members in their capacity to so say bind the members, bind the members, choir, choir, choir is in Latin, it simply means in their capacity, choir members, choir members, in their capacity as members of the company and not in any other capacity. So in this case, if you are to elaborate, maybe they could put their eight marks. So it simply means that once the articles are registered, uh, the members of the company will be bound to the company. And in case they commit any wrong against the company with regard to the articles, members can actually be held responsible. The company can take action. Kuna hizo rules, kuna constitution ya yo kampuni. Tuseme member moja wa yo kampuni akose kukwata yo constitution and he does something wrong against the company. The company will take action. How will it take action? They can sue the member in a court of law because he's not actually following the rules governing the internal affairs of the company. That's what they mean by it binds you as a member to the company. If you do anything that exactly goes against those particular articles, against that particular constitution, you can be held responsible by the company. So now the company is a person. It can be able to sue and be sued. So it can take action. It is a person now under the law, one of the characteristics of a company, it can sue and be sued. So therefore it can now sue you as a member in a court of law. It also happens the other way around. So now this particular point is now the other way around. Now in this case, if the company has done anything wrong against the members, for example, with regard to the rules governing the internal affairs, the members can take action against the company. They can sue the company in a court of law because it can sue or be sued. It can sue or be sued. This one now, it binds the members among themselves. So if a member of a company does anything wrong against the other member of the company, with regard to the rules governing the internal affairs of the company, that member can take action against that other member by simply suing him in a court of, court of law. It binds the members in their capacity as members and not in any other capacity. Because they are the rules governing the internal affairs, it will bind you as a member of the company. You know you could actually be a member of a company, but you are related to the company in another capacity. Maybe you are a supplier, or you are a creditor, or you are a customer. It doesn't bind you as a customer or as a supplier. It binds you as a member of the company because 
These are rules governing the internal affairs of the company. So those are basically the legal effects of basically registering the articles of association of the company. Once you deposit them in the register of companies, these effects will basically come into effect. So, so that is that is a point to be able to actually it has been tested like twice or thrice, I think twice or thrice in the exam. So it's good that at least you have an idea because if you end up being blank, then uh, life will be tough. Life will be hard in the exam book. Life will be hard in the exam book. Then uh, if they talk about altering the articles, the company can be able to alter the articles by passing a spatial resolution. I hope you know what a spatial resolution at, at this particular point. It is simply a resolution that must actually be approved or passed by at least 75% of members who are allowed to attend and vote at such kind of a meeting. So at least 75%. If it is 60, it won't go through. So articles should actually be altered by a special resolution. At least 75% of members who are allowed to vote and actually approve resolutions at such kind of a meeting. So it can actually be altered to a special resolution. After that, basically you need to deposit these particular articles you've altered with the register of companies. Remember, when you are registering the company, you deposited the articles, but now you've altered them. So ule mtu ulipelekea ukiform kampuni hapo kwa register. Inafaa pia ukichange, umupelekea tena umambie, hizo articles, they are not the valid ones. I have changed. You give him the other. The other. It's a requirement on the Companies Act. When the articles are actually altered, you also basically inform the register of companies within a period of 14 days that basically you've actually been able to alter the articles of association because they could ask what are the requirements under the Companies Act with regard to alteration of articles. So just they just want basically to be able to briefly explain the procedure of how articles will be altered. Articles can actually be altered by passing a special resolution. So you can imagine if you mention that as the first point. The examiner basically will actually be able to know that this particular student actually understands what is being tested. You must pass a special resolution at a general meeting of, of the company. After the articles have actually been altered through a special resolution, then of course, you must actually be able to deposit the new articles or the altered articles with the register of companies within a period of 14, 14 days. So that is actually very, very important. It is actually very important. So I want us to look at another question here. There's another question I want us to look at here. Another question I want us to look at here. Let's see if I'll get it. I think I've gotten it. So it's that question 7A, Roman 1. It says, describe eight particulars of secretaries that are required to be contained in the company's register of secretaries. Then Roman 2, set two grounds of, for disqualification from being 
registered as a company uh, secretary. So what are the grounds of actually being disqualified from being registered as a company uh, secretary? So you can start with that particular first one. Describe eight particulars of secretaries that are required to be contained in a company register of secretaries. So uh, I think there are several registers we've come across in company law. Because the question could actually just be simple like this. Set four registers that are found in a company. That one should actually be an easy mark to be able to score. You can actually be able to remember very fast we've talked about register of members, register of debenture holders, register of charges, register of company secretaries, register of directors of the company. So at least you should actually be able to uh, scoop those marks very easily because the question could just be simple like that. Register, which kind of registers are normally found in the, in the company? Register of members, register of debenture holders, register of company secretaries, register of directors, register of the charges of the company and the other registers. So I think uh, you can be able to get them in your, in your notes. So they are talking about this particular register of company secretaries. So what should that, should it actually be able to, uh, to contain? If you can remember very well, when you are learning about the company secretary, I told you the company secretary can actually be an individual or it can actually be a corporate entity. In this case, it can actually basically be a corporate entity or, for example, a partnership. People have just basically registered their corporate entity to basically provide company secretarial services to other companies. For example, in this case, we said, for example, if you do your CPA, then later on you do your CS exam, you could actually basically register your own firm to provide company secretarial services to other companies. So in this case, there could be a register that should act, could actually be able to contain particulars of a person who is just an individual. That register will contain certain details. Alternatively, also, if the register basically is talking about a corporate entity, there are those details that should actually basically be able to come out with regard to the corporate entity that is, that is providing company secretarial services to the company. So what are the particulars in this case? What are the particulars in this case? For example, if it is just an individual, if it is just an individual, or it's just a natural person. So particulars with regard to natural persons, particulars of a natural person in, a, in, a, in that particular register, particulars of a natural person, particulars of a natural person, particulars of a natural person. So what will con be contained there? What you mean by a natural person, just like me and you? providing company secretarial services to a company. What do they basically indicate in their register in that case? So you can have the name, the name of the company secretary. You can have the name of the company secretary, the name of the company secretary, the name of the company secretary. You can have the address of the company secretary, address of the company secretary address of the company secretary address of the company secretary uh, we can have uh, date of appointment and exit we can have date of appointment of appointment and exit appointments and exit as the company secretary so that is basically with regards to if it is actually a natural person so particulars to be contained in the register if it is a natural person that particular register will have the name of the company secretary, the address of the company secretary, date of appointment and exits as the company secretary of the company. Of the company. What of if it is actually a, a, a company or a corporate entity or a firm? So for example, in this case, it is a partnership firm. What will actually be contained in that particular register? What will be contained in that particular register? Hope you will actually already capture this particular point because in this case, you are just taking short notes, short notes. Those notes you can actually be able to peruse in within 20 minutes, just before the exam. And of course, when you get the question in the exam, you should actually just be able to smile and actually just indicate your point very clearly. And of course, you'll be able to score your marks. So hope you've taken your short notes. So I want us to move to, uh, with regard to a corporate entity or a firm. What are the details to be contained there? So the details to be contained there in case it is actually a registered partnership firm or basically a company. So details with regard to a company 
if it is a company or a corporate entity or a firm or a partnership firm. So what will be contained there? What will be contained there in that particular register? So number one, what will be contained there is the name of the company or firm, name of the company or firm, name of the company or firm, name of the company or firm. Number two, what will be contained there is the registered office of the company, registered office of the company or firm, registered office of the company or firm, registered, registered office of the company or firm. Then also what will be contained there, the legal form under which the company or firm operates, the legal form under which, the legal form under which, under which the company or firm operates, or firm operates, the legal form under which the company or firm operates. Uh, what do we mean by this? Is it a partnership? Is it a company? So should actually be able to indicate the legal form. Is it a limited company? Which kind of company is it? Yeah, so that is what they mean by the legal form under which it actually operates. Then also what will be contained there is um, So the registration number, the registration number of the firm, the registration number, the registration number of the firm at the registrar's office, registrar's office, the registrar's office. Office. So these are some of the points that will actually basically our teachers will be found in that particular register in case it is actually a company or a firm. It is actually a company or or a firm. If it is actually a company or or a firm, it is actually a company or or a firm. It is actually a company or a firm. It is actually a company or a firm. It is actually a company or a firm. So then, uh, then we have uh, Roman two. It says the grounds upon which a company uh, uh, secretary might not actually be registered in Kenya. So uh, you can actually be able to mention uh, number one, the first points. If he has been convicted, if he has been convicted by a court of law of an offense of fraud or dishonesty. That is Roman two answer. If he has been convicted by a court of law of dishonesty or fraud, if he has been convicted by a, a court of law of, a, of an offense of an offense of fraud or dishonesty, if he has been convicted by a court of law of a, uh, of, a, of an offense of fraud or dishonesty, if he has been convicted by a court of law of an offense of an offense of fraud or dishonesty, of fraud or dishonesty, of fraud or dishonesty. If he has been convicted by a court of law of an offense of fraud or dishonesty. Now you can actually talk about if he is undischarged bankrupt or declared to be bankrupt, if he is undischarged bankrupt, so that is point number two. If he is undischarged bankrupt or declared to be bankrupt. If he is undischarged bankrupt or declared to be bankrupt. If he is undischarged bankrupt or declared to be bankrupt. Then uh, you can also be able to talk about if he is of unsound mind. If he is of unsound mind. If he is of unsound mind. If he is of unsound mind, if he is of unsound mind, if he is of unsound mind, if he is of unsound mind.
So there's a, another one which I want us to look at about company secretaries. So there's another one which I want us to look at about company secretaries. So there's that question, it's, it's from November 2017, question 2B, November 2017, question 2B, November 2017, question 2B, it's about duties of a company secretary. This particular question has been tested, it's very common in the exam, about company secretary duties, it's like almost five times or six times has been tested, so uh, you can't afford to not know about the duties of a company secretary. But in this case, they are now basically asking you to distinguish them as statutory and also administrative. So company secretaries perform different types of duties in a company. With reference to the above statement, explain five duties of a company secretary under each of the two categories below. So they have said statutory duties and administrative duties. What they mean by statutory duties, these are basically those of, for example, outlined under the Companies Act, under the statutes. Under the statutes, they are known as statutory. If you look at the Companies Act, you see they have indicated that these are basically the duties of a company secretary. What they mean by administrative, these are basically the ones that can actually be given out by the directors of the company because they are actually the appointing authority. So we can start with the statutory duties of a company secretary. So number one, number one, one, this would actually be able to know about the duties of a company secretary. So number one, statutory duties. Number one, statutory duties. Ensure the registers of the company are up to date. Ensure the registers of the company are up to date. Ensure the registers of the company are up to date. Up to date up to date and available for inspection. Ensure the registers of the company are up to date and available for inspection. Ensure the registers of the company are up to date and available for inspection and available for inspection and available for inspection. Uh, the next one, to ensure the safe custody and use of the company seal to ensure the safe custody and use of the company seal to ensure the safe custody and use of the company seal to ensure the safe custody and use of the company seal the next one to ensure the annual returns, to ensure the annual returns, to ensure the annual returns to the registrar, to the registrar are accurate and submitted on time. To ensure the annual returns to the registrar are accurate and submitted on time. To ensure the annual returns to the registrar of companies, uh, registrar, just to the registrar are accurate and submitted on time. To ensure the annual returns the registrar are accurate and submitted on time and submitted on time and submitted on time and submitted on time the next one to ensure the company complies to ensure the company complies complies with the Companies Act, the Companies Act, comma, the articles and the memorandum of association to ensure the company complies with the Companies Act, to ensure the company complies 
with the Companies Act to ensure the company complies with the Companies Act to ensure the company complies with the Companies Act, with the Companies Act, with the Companies Act, comma, articles of association, articles of association, articles of association, and memorandum of association, and memorandum of association, and memorandum of association. Another point, another point, to ensure changes in membership of the company are handled accurately. To ensure changes in membership of the company are handled accurately. To ensure changes in membership of the company are handled accurately. To ensure changes in membership of the company are handled accurately, are handled accurately. To ensure changes in membership of the company are handled accurately. Are handled accurately. Are handled accurately. So uh, you can you can go to the next one. Administrative duties. Administrative duties of the company secretary. Administrative duties. So these ones can be given by. Uh, the board of directors on appointment as among the duties he is supposed to perform as a company secretary. So, uh, number one, registration of share transfers. Registration of share transfers. We are talking about administrative duties. So, number one, registration of share transfers. Registration of share transfers. The next one, number two, guiding the board of directors, guiding the board of directors on good corporate governance, on good corporate governance, guiding the board of directors on good corporate governance, on good corporate governance, guiding the board of directors on good corporate governance, on good corporate governance. on good corporate governance. Uh, the next one, issuing out notices of board and members meetings. Issuing out notices of board and members meetings. Issuing out notices, issuing out notices of board and members meetings. Issuing out notices of board and members meetings, issuing out notices of board, and members meetings, and members meetings. Issuing out notices of board, and members meetings, and members meetings. Uh, another one, uh, <clears throat> providing, providing support providing support and guiding the executive and non-executive directors providing support providing support and guiding the executive and non-executive directors providing support and guiding the executive and non-executive directors eg eg on their statutory obligations on their statutory obligations e.g on what are their requirements under the statute on their statutory obligations e.g on their statutory obligations 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 on their statutory obligations. On their statutory obligations. On their statutory obligations. On their statutory obligations. On their statutory
on their statutory obligations. Their statutory obligations. So those are the duties of our uh, company secretary. Duties of our company secretary. So they could talk about the qualifications. Uh, you must be a member of the Institute of Certified Public Secretaries of Kenya. So such kind of points. Uh, you must be a person with the requisite knowledge and experience, or you've worked as a company secretary elsewhere before the board can actually be able to appoint you as a company uh, secretary, as a company secretary. So uh, I wish to end there this particular class. I wish to end there this particular class. Uh, we have just one final class, one final class. Uh, I hope you've been able to get some time to try and revise on your own. Mm, sometimes uh, it, is, it is normally the wish of the teacher to do more, but you also do try to do something on your side, the better. So I think I've been providing enough guidance. I've repeated some of the things you need to be very keen on. I've shared some model papers. I've been insisting you just go through them. Some videos have been shared. I've been encouraging you to go through them. Uh, and as I told you, uh, from the, when the time the semester started, uh, sometimes uh, students take theory papers to be very easy. But what I encourage you, just come to the class. Just listen to the teacher. Just listen to the teacher. You will never have regrets of having listened to the teacher in the class. When you go into that particular exam room, you'll basically be, uh, be smiling. Uh, I think we'll do our final class on Sunday. What I've just been insisting on, uh, make sure at least you understand the case laws. They're just like four major ones. If you have a clue about them, Salomon versus Salomon and Company Limited. And of course, I told you this particular case laws, they have exceptions. Salomon and Salomon versus, Com Salomon, versus uh, Salomon and Company Limited. It has exceptions to that particular case law. Uh, the majority rule or the rule in force versus sub tool, it has exceptions to that particular case law. Trevor versus Whitworth, this particular case law, it has exceptions. We have uh, Sharp versus Dawis. That particular case law, it has exceptions. Although it was tested in the last city, what are the chances they will repeat? Uh, the chances are actually quite minimal. So basically, you should actually look, be, be looking at these other ones. Royal British Bank versus Tark Fund. I think it was stated in the last sitting, or is it the other one? What are the chances they'll repeat? So there are just like five major case laws that have actually exceptions. They like testing these particular areas. Salomon versus Salomon and Company Limited. It talks about the lifting of the veil of incorporation. This particular uh, uh, case law, it has exceptions. If you have an idea about the exceptions, you are better off. You are actually good to go. It is actually just the same as lifting of the veil of incorporation. Should I actually be able to understand what is lifting of the veil of incorporation? So I think if you remind me next time, I should actually be able to explain further about this one. Lifting of the veil of incorporation. All these cases I've talked about, they have exceptions. And of course, when they test, most probably they like testing also, what are the exceptions? Or they could actually basically bring a scenario relating to this particular case laws. So you should actually be able to know exactly what uh, they are looking for. So if you have an idea about them, the better. I've also talked about formation of companies, which I've just gone through. I don't want this particular topic to give you a lot of difficulties. So I've really tried to go through on some of the areas they're likely to test because if they bring like maybe 30 marks, then you are blank. You can imagine how that particular paper might look very difficult for you. Uh, there are questions I shared there's a handout I shared about shares, share capital and debt capital. I told you the time is actually a bit limited. I might not actually be able to go through a lot, most of these particular areas, but if you go those, through those particular materials, that it, that it will become very easy for you. Uh, for example, if maybe in the next class, I just touch on a few questions about shares, debt capital, and maybe share capital. 
you should actually be able to maybe have grasped a lot if you go through that particular Q and A. It is a Q and A about shares, share capital, and actually debt, uh, debt capital. So uh, these are the topics are not actually quite difficult. It basically, you, re you realize uh, company meetings is not that hard. It's not a very difficult topic. Directors also is not that difficult. If you just read, basically, you can actually be able to understand very fast. But I hope maybe next time I'll be able to go through questions with regard to this particular topic about company meetings. Maybe you can tackle also directors a bit if I get the time. Uh, then also accounts and investigations. I think last time we tackled some questions about corporate restructuring. We did some foreign companies and also a bit of liquidation. So I think maybe next time I should actually do to look at maybe company meetings or maybe the directors. Some videos were actually shared on that particular group of ours. Or I insisted, like I told you, go through this particular videos those videos are actually very helpful especially those ones about television there's a lot you'll be able to get when you basically just watch that video you'll get a lot that i might not i might fail to mention here in the live class so if you go through these particular materials i can easily assure you the paper will be very easy the paper will be very easy so uh, just keep on revising remember revise until the last minute don't basically reach a point and say I've basically grasped a lot so I can relax. The secret basically is just to revise up to the last minute. That time you're entering the exam room. So if you do like that, basically this paper will become very easy. It won't actually be very tough, even for the other papers. Uh, revise until the last minute. So revise like, don't feel that you've grasped a lot, you've gotten a lot. Just continue revising, even repeat those things you've already revised. So it will be very easy uh, once you just step into the, the exam room. So uh, that is basically what I can actually be able to tell you and maybe encourage you about. So we'll do our final class on uh, probably Sunday. Then you guys can actually be able to just go for the exam room, to the exam room and actually do your, do your exam. And I can assure you, if you've basically been following the classes, going through the, those particular notes, just been sharing here and there, here and there, here and there, be 100% assured the exam will actually be very easy. As I told you, some students just assume these theory papers, they never come to the class. For them, sometimes it becomes very difficult, especially if you are revising on your own. You know here, basically what the teacher does, he touches on the main areas he knows, this one is likely to be tested. So you can imagine if you are going through the notes and you don't know where exactly they can test, how they will test. So it becomes even very difficult or uncomfortable for you even to, uh, to revise. So uh, we'll meet on Sunday and actually do our, our final class. But of course, if you have any query, you can always reach out to me or you can give me a call. Uh, if I have some free time, I can actually be able to guide you. So now you can be able to approach uh, some of these uh, questions so that we shall be celebrating come January when we'll be moving to uh, the next level. So I think we'll meet next time and uh, you guys can have a good night.